Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Hayes. Uh, I'm an assistant director with the University Community Service Center, one, and the Chicago Studies Program is one of the things that I work on. Uh, we're excited and happy to be a co-sponsor for this event today. Welcome to the Writing About Chicago contest reading and reception. So if that is what, not what you are here for, <laughs> we welcome you to stay. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'll start with a quotation, I guess appropriate for uh, uh, reading. A facade of skyscrapers facing a lake and behind the facade, every type of dubiousness. This is how British author E.M. Forster described our fair city. We're here tonight to celebrate the writing of University of Chicago undergraduates that focuses on the lake, the facade, and the dubiousness behind it. We celebrate the writing that draws on inspiration from the city, reflects experiences in its neighborhoods, and shows a care and passion for its people. We'll hear from three student authors in three categories, fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. Uh, these are from the, I think, literally dozens of students who submitted pieces for this contest. Um, and among those exemplary pieces, the work of these three students stood out. So uh, very excited and, and happy and uh, excited to be able to congratulate them and share their work with you tonight. Uh, before we hear from our winners, though, I have some folks that I absolutely need to acknowledge and thank. Um, thanks, first of all, as I said earlier, to you for joining us this evening. Um, thanks to the Creative Writing Program, Professor Janice Knight, Amy Chu, especially Kate Soto, without their partnership, um, and, and Jennifer, who I just met earlier tonight, uh, without their partnership, uh, we wouldn't have this event, or if we did, we wouldn't have the professional expertise in finding and supporting our fantastic student writers. So I think the writing might be, be very different without them. Uh, here. Thanks also to the Logan Center for the Arts. It's an amazing space that we get to spend time in. Uh, I mentioned skyscrapers uh, a few seconds ago, and this adds to the city's incredible set of perhaps not skyscrapers, but certainly tall buildings. Um, uh, I'm really glad that they were able to open this up for us this evening. As you may see around us, this is, is an incredible space, but they're also in the midst of, of finishing things in it. So we get to be one of the first groups that uh, inaugurates this. Uh, so I'm excited to be here for that. A special thank you to our judges who had the unenviable task of selecting winners from such a, a strong set of submissions. And finally, thank you to the authors, uh, the ones you're here tonight, and all the writers who make this campus a vibrant part of Chicago's literary culture. And Chicago po poet Carl Sandburg wrote, here's the difference between Dante, Milton, and me. They wrote about hell and never saw the place. I wrote about Chicago after looking the town over for years and years. This is one of the things that distinguishes Chicago writing. It is rooted in place and in experience. Um, and our first reader continues that tradition of rootedness. Uh, Michael Lipkowitz is a graduating fourth year, majoring in English with an honors concentration in creative writing. Uh, this quarter, instead of taking classes, he's been moonlighting as a preschool teacher. Most recently, he is writing, his writing has been published in the Midway Review, um, and pardon, I may mispronounce some of these, the Maycomb Journal, the Stockyard Magazine, Slice Bread Magazine, and the Chicago Studies blog, the blog that works. Uh, he has received a, a, a Festival of the Arts grant twice and a Summer Arts Council grant once for which he wrote a poetry chapbook about cemeteries around the world. Um, reading from Tales from Von Steuben High, please welcome Michael Lipkowitz. Tom from Geometry said that Angie Rice's parents are foreign diplomats and that she lives by herself in a giant mansion. Jenny from English told me during break that Angie writes about killing everybody in that neon green notebook she always carries around. Stacy told me while we were doing laps in gym that Angie was caught stealing a manhole cover five blocks from school, but Stacy didn't know if it was true or just a rumor. Nobody knew who this girl really was. At Von Steuben, there are two kinds of girls, the girls that you talk to and the girls that you wouldn't touch with a vaulting pole. Angie Rice was one of those girls. She wore a pair of goggles around her neck and her coat was covered with cotton patches. Her hair had been dyed so many times even she probably couldn't remember the original color. God knows when she had last washed it. There aren't that many outsiders at Vaughn. It's a magnet school that gets students from all over Chicago, even the furthest neighborhoods in the South Side. But since everyone is equally an outsider, we all sort of get to know each other, become friends with people from different backgrounds. There are no racial lines here, uh, unlike the rest of the city, which is literally drawn along lines of race. So how could a girl like Angie, with her toffee-colored skin, become such a social outcast of Vaughn? I watch her every day as she walks through the halls on the way to homeroom. 
What is she thinking about as she stares at us through those smudge goggles? What does she see? August 24th. Strange, strange things happen in the city, but people don't really talk about them. A pit bull ran onto a CTA bus in Bronzeville. Its owner, a 60-year-old man, stood shocked outside the bus holding the leash as the dog ran down the aisle, growling and yapping at some poor old ladies wearing swim caps. What was that pit bull thinking? It must have been so excited, it's one moment of, of excitement in a mundane life. Afterwards, its owner probably scolded it and punished it somehow, locked it up in an iron cage. Poor dog. Are things that different for me than for the pit bull? I step onto the foster bus to go to Jeff Jefferson Park every morning, and the other girls from Vaughn cower away as I growl and foam at the mouth. Don't worry, I say, scowling. My bark is bigger than my bite. I've only ever heard Angie Rice say two things. The first was at the mandatory assembly that was held after her sister was mugged and shot in Lakeview. Her sister's name was Marcy, and she was in the scholars program, which, at a school as small as Vaughn, amounted to reading an extra book every summer and writing one report about it. I remember she read For Whom the Bell Tolls and wrote a paper that won the Bookworm Award. That summer, there were only three honor students. I wasn't one of them. Richie and Stacy and I sat in the back row at the award ceremony, popping bubblegum and snickering as they were handed their awards. At the assembly commemorating Marcy's death, the principal took attendance and Angie said, here, and that was the first time I ever heard her speak. Everyone turned to look at her at once, as if to say, that's the girl who got us out of calculus, or poor freak, or look at her hair. Angie's voice cracked when she said the word here, and the room sort of felt different afterwards, like after a bell rings at the end of class. When the ringing stops, you're in the same room with the same people, but the air is somehow different. The assembly dragged on. Principal Rodriguez talked about mourning and coping and being there for Angie in her time of loss. The whole time, Angie was scribbling in her stupid notebook with a big pen. Before that assembly, she had been your average wallflower, but now? Now, a science exhibit, evidence of life on Mars, we stared at her as if through a pane of glass. September 2nd, they found a cat walking around with an arrow through its head downtown. A lady screamed and fainted, and then an ambulance came. The medics didn't know if they were supposed to revive the lady or the cat. They ended up sharing the ambulance. It took them three hours to remove the arrow from the cat's skull, but it was fine. The arrow narrowly missed its brain. Nobody knows how the arrow got into the cat's head or whose cat it is. That's how they must see me walking around, like I have an arrow through my head or I have this big open wound on my side or something. If I collapsed to the ground and started convulsing like Marcy, I don't think any of them would think twice. The police officers told me that she was killed instantly and didn't feel anything as she hit the ground, but I think she felt something. Her soul being ripped out of her body like that, her body being ripped out of her name, she must have felt cold. I want to start over. I want to go to a new school and start over. I'll get a new name. The second and only other thing Angie ever said to me was during gym. We collided in the locker room and she said sorry. I was too stunned to reply, hearing her voice. I stared at her and she stared back and the whole locker room went silent for a second. The smell of ax st stung my eyes and the sound of a locker slamming brought me back. She sneered at me, pushed me to the wall and walked past me. But I didn't just see her as a pity case like everybody else. I dreamed of talking to her, of asking her who she was and why she wore those goggles around her neck and if she really lived in a big mansion all by herself. I would ask her where she got those patches from, find out if her parents were really foreign diplomats. What if that were me? All alone in that big mansion, my parents halfway across the world? I close my eyes and think about it and see dark hallways and shiver. I never planned on talking to her until I found her journal underneath the bleachers. It was a flash of neon green in the corner of my eye. Holding it in my hands, I felt its holiness. The notebook glowed and vibrated. I put it in my knapsack and carried it around for the rest of the day, relishing the little bit of extra weight on my back. October 23rd. The winters here are brutal. In mid-February this year, when the snow finally melted, they found the body of a 60-year-old woman lying at the intersection of 31st and Halstead. She'd been missing since just before Christmas. Her family said she had just walked off after dinner for a nice evening stroll. Investigators say she probably died due to exposure from the cold. Around the same time, a man was found frozen to death in his home on West Birchwood, Birchwood Avenue in Rogers Park. He was pronounced dead at 1.45 a.m. at the Stein Institute. Witnesses say he was discovered in his home with no heat. Why, I wonder? Had his radiator malfunctioned overnight? Maybe he hadn't been paying the bills. Or maybe, maybe he turned the radiator off himself. Maybe that grandma in Bridgeport knew exactly where she was going when she left home for her nice evening stroll. Lunch at Vaughn is a big thing. The school lets all students go off campus. There are huge underground subcultures revolving around where you go to eat. Where you go says everything about the kind of person that you are. I usually eat under the bleachers out of a brown bag I packed myself. Every day I see the cool kids go across the river walk to Northside and the burnouts walk down to the river behind school where they always smoke weed while eating lunch. I don't envy them at all. 
They stare at me when they come back with blood red eyes, jaws slack, laughing. The winters here are brutal. What does it mean, I asked, flipping through the pages of her notebook. Angie stared across at me with no expression on her face. Shafts of sunlight filter through the bleachers. Tom told me she hung out down here during lunch and smoked cigarettes. Why do you care? Leave me alone. Give me my journal. She grabbed it from me, ripping a few of the pages. Look what you did, you moron. She collapsed into a heap in the grass, the notebook lying open beside her. It was a drawing of a cat with an arrow through its head. This is pretty gruesome, you know. If one of our teachers caught you with this, you might get sent to the school counselor. She groaned. I never told you to read it. Besides, so what? I already go twice a week. Her voice came muffled through the grass. Why? She kicked at me, but she missed and hit the stands. Go away! I turned to go, but something kept me rooted to the spot. The sun glinted off her goggles. She lifted herself up onto her knees and sighed, tracing her finger across the design in her knee patch. There, there are things I hear in the news, okay? Strange things that happen here, in this city. I write about them. Or sometimes draw pictures, I guess. Like the cat? I winced. Yeah, it's real. They found a cat walking around with an arrow through its head. Nobody knew, knew where it was from. November 13th, they found a human foot in Lake Michigan. A woman was running along the lake in Ravenswood and she saw it bobbing, bits of bloody tissue still hanging from the end of it. The white bone shimmered in the sunlight when the police came and pulled it out. It gathered a big crowd even though it was midday Wednesday. They used sonar equipment to search the water. Gossip about the killer spread through Vaughn like lightning bolts. Everyone texted their best friends and loved ones. People started staring at me, whispering, pointing. Apparently, after eight hours of searching, they discovered that the foot was just a Halloween prop. Little things like this happen every day, but who's watching? It all happens so fast, and if I don't document it, will it even exist? Mr. Raymond says that if nobody hears a tree falling, it doesn't make a sound. Something to do with sound waves and particles of air. But what about me? If nobody sees me leave class, and nobody hears me crying out here under the bleachers, am I even here at all? We talked some more after that, but I don't remember most of it. I should have been memorizing everything she said so I could write it down later, but for some reason I forgot. It was like we were in our own world. I got a break from all my friends, all the gossip and the pressure of living in a segregated city. She told me story after story. We didn't talk about Marcy or about her parents. I still don't know very much about her, I guess. If I told Tom or Stacy that I talked to Angie Rice under the bleachers during lunch hour, I don't think they would believe me, but I don't want them to know anyways. At a small school like Vaughn, everyone gets to know you so well, you don't feel like you ever get a chance to do something unexpected, be somebody different. But after that afternoon, I felt like I had a secret, like I could lead a double life if I really wanted to. Now I pass Angie in the halls and we smile at each other, and there's something nice about that. We don't talk anymore, but maybe one day, maybe. Uh, thank you and congratulations, Michael. Um, I realize I should have said this earlier um, in the sort of, I don't know, Vanna White moment, uh, tell them what they've won. Uh, uh, the, the winners today are recognized both by being here, by having to embarrass themselves publicly, uh, by getting up and speaking. Uh, hopefully they won't feel embarrassed. Their writing certainly doesn't deserve that. Um, but also uh, we're able to provide them with a $100 uh, prize. So I uh, wanted to let folks know that and uh, congratulate them in that way. So thank you and congratulations, Michael. Um, as Oliver Wendell Holmes once wrote, Chicago sounds rough to the maker of verse. One comfort we have, Cincinnati sounds worse. <laughs> Thankfully, we have authors who, at least since 1880, have found Chicago sufficiently inspiring, even if it still doesn't scan very well. Um, and with that, I'd like to bring up uh, Nassim Jamnia. She's a third year biological sciences major and creative writing minor. Um, and she did, in fact, provide me with a slightly longer bio, bio but this is the, the truncated version. She spends her days playing with laboratory mice, cuddling her giant stuffed neuron Norbert, and drinking cups of English tea number one. I'm really excited to uh, welcome our second reader, Nassim Jamnia, reading Chicago Ghazals. Sort of a brief introduction to these. Ghazals are traditionally um, couplets that are rhyming, and they were usually written in Farsi or in Urdu. Um, uh, Spencer Reese wrote a set called Florida Ghazals, which was about Florida, and they had traced these different characters that go throughout them. And I did sort of a similar thing only with Chicago. So there are um, seven characters and seven sets. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> Chicago Ghazals. One. Up here, the sun bounces off the blankets of snow, muffling sound. Up here, the wind is what speaks. We grew up in a house where stairs creaked and spirits dance. Music filled the halls. I still cringe at the sight of cockroaches, even though they littered the linoleum floor. 
Omid learned to sneer and snarl at age 14. Her scathing remarks pushed people away. He whispers the lyrics of the country to the city tune. He misses the stars he spied on back home. Craig clings to stories that make him out to be content. He speaks little of his own thoughts. Ramona once dreamed of dancing and of painting the stars. Now, no longer, she suffocates in her sleep. I sit at a table heaped with food. My tongue chokes my throat and I eat my silence. Two. There was a blue sign outside that said our home was spiritual and open to visitors. It was surrounded by flowers, but once we leave, they wilt. People in passing ask me how things are and I blink. My mind checked out long ago and my lips have sealed. They say the city rips itself in half. I've lived both sides. Weakly, Craig presses his lips to the neck of another. Their faces always change, but his hopes do not. Ramona quickly learned the way around Logan Square. Her leash lets her go no farther. Southern boys mock my accent, silencing my song. My lips curl, crude comments cut down. Omid hated the city's wind and complained about the cold. When her family fled to the suburbs, she sneered her approval. Three. When his body contorts with lust, Craig relents. Afterwards, his words say nothing. Ramona glares when she looks in the mirror. She is not the humbled park princess her parents demand. Omid and I used to roam downtown. We escaped the friends we didn't have. He laughed when they thought he was kidding about his blood poisoning his veins. His knew his heart would fail, but hoped his mind never would. In an overhead pass, traffic whirls underneath. I still hear its hums as it sinks into my bones. My stomach retched an awful truth. I ignored its cries for months to come. When I was young, crows lined the walk around my home. Only years later did I realize they disappeared. Four. They say that 1967 was the last snowstorm as strong as this one. I counted on my fingers, waiting for the death toll to rise. Ramona joined choir to learn how to sing. The wind would seize her voice and carry it away. As kids, my father used to claim our home was haunted by a family ghoul. In the new house, the hallways echo in its absence. Craig claims that the wind is why he is shivering. I do not say that I know the truth. Numbers tick down towards an ideal I can never reach. I'm unbalanced between my own fantasies. I try to teach her the meaning of her name, though I fail. Omid only roughly translates to hope. He spends his days hunting the cure for others. He finds quick fixes tucked in syringes and medicine warming on the counter. Five, how do I find the name for something I cannot admit? I missed classes to ask others to do it for me. The river lulled me to sleep in my formative years. Now I reach a hand to dip into its green reflection. Choked by her panic, Ramona didn't speak in school. She relied on me to try for her. I stood outside of what they told me was now home and cringed. A year later, I finally bids Ravenswood goodbye. City winds allow him to hide his bruises the way that Southern heat never could. He shot down my concerns and told me to focus on myself. He admits truths to me when he's stone dead drunk. Craig's admissions the next day never feel quite as real. Omid's honesty burned away her friendships. One summer, she tried to steer her mine. Six, the city is trashed in graffiti, but the streets lie clean. I laugh and strain to shatter my judgments. Ramona was in awe of Omid for years. Her imitation clanged a few notes short. A stack of papers tuck themselves away beneath my desk. Twice a week, for eight months, they follow me around. I visited Omid after two years of silence. Smirking, she called herself a deserter and told me she was leaving again. He found that carrying two hearts was often heavy. I lost my voice in singing his burden away. Our voices used to echo through three floors even though ceilings blocked the way. Now those barriers have dropped, but we cannot hear a sound. He sees our silences from an outside perspective. Craig bids him to speak and me to stand. Seven, the floors echo even when I wear sneakers. I'm told it's typical to find hospitals empty the first time. Craig's laugh is sobering. I shiver but do not respond. He begins to untangle the mess around him. In other cities, looking up is a sign that you don't belong. Here, I look up every time, regardless. Once, Ramona interfered in a fight between him and me. She fumbled, for, in, she fumbled her words in trying to speak for the first time. I scratched my name into the gazebo after my father built it. I stamped a sign into the empty closet wall and left. Confined by both the city and its suburbs, Omid abandoned herself to the mountains. I hope she would learn to love someone beyond herself and me. 
He and I are told to look at each other. We'd rather ignore our faults. Our voices get tangled yet again. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations, Nessie. Um, and now to our, our final reading in the nonfiction category. Um, I'll get us a, in the mood a little bit with a quotation from one of the giants of Chicago nonfiction, uh, who also happens to be a 1934 alum uh, of the university with a degree in law, uh, when you could get a bachelor's in law at that point. Uh, Studs Terkel, some of you may have guessed who I was talking about, uh, said about Chicago politics, Chicago is not the most corrupt American city. It's the most theatrically corrupt. And you'll see why that's relevant to our next reading. Uh, Caroline O'Donovan is a soon-to-be graduate of the University of Chicago Political Science and English Departments with a lifelong interest in politics and journalism. Uh, originally from New Jersey, Caroline spent the past four years on campus working for the UC Democrats as their director of community outreach. She's also been a leader in the arts community, helping to grow the Dean's Men Theater Troupe and the 24-hour play festival. She spent over two years working for the university news office, uh, during which time she also interned at the Illinois Arts Alliance, uh, I'm sorry, Arts Alliance Illinois, uh, the Obama for America Communications Department, and the Better Government Association, where she started or excuse me, helped to start a citizen watchdog training program. Most recently, she's worked at the New Republic, where she published a book review on history and religion. Caroline is currently a production intern at WBEZ, the local um, NPR station, and her writing appears at the Huffington Post, Chicagoist, and Gaper's Block. Um, and I definitely recommend those last two, Chicagoist and Gaper's Block, if you have an interest in the city uh, and don't know those. Uh, Caroline tweets at, <laughs> at C. O'Donovan, so you can now all follow her. <laughs> Here to read Out of Turn, a campaign story, Caroline O'Donnell. Um, so this is in some ways a story that is over and in some ways a story that is still happening. I'm going to read a version, the version that I submitted um, 10 days. This is a story about an election. Um, I submitted this to the department 10 days um, before the election. And although that was held on March 20th, it is not yet completely over. <laughs> um, I really like Dan's actually Nelson Algren quote at the top, and I have one that goes with this. Uh, even though I later make fun of people, writers who can't resist reading other people's quotes about Chicago. Um, but it's, loving Chicago is like loving a woman with a broken nose. That's Nelson Algren. The first thing that everybody seems to notice about Will Gazzardi is that his hair is well on its way to being almost completely gray. For a candidate for political office, a little gray is usually a good thing. It adds an air of distinction. For Gazzardi, it might be especially helpful, seeing as he's taking his first stab at politics by running for state representative against the Cook County Democratic machine. I sat down with a lot of people when I was getting started, Gazzardi said at a campaign event just 20 days before the election, and I remember one of those conversations like it was yesterday. Someone said to me, you'll get 20 or 30 percent, and you'll be out of Chicago in three months. Six months prior, Will Gazzardi announced his candidacy for state representative in the 39th district in that very same room. That night, the bar had been filled with his friends, a large group of 20-somethings who knew very little of how much a part of their lives his campaign was about to become. That night, with a new haircut, red tie, and press suit, Will Gazzardi, formerly of the Huffington Post, became a candidate. In the first year or so that I knew Gazzardi, he was the Chicago editor for the Huffington Post, writing about city and state politics, or as the campaign rap reads, covering local leaders and investigating corruption. It was through such a piece of reporting that Gazzardi eventually came to turn the buzz stop barbershop at Albany and Diversity into his very own campaign headquarters. In the fall of 2010, Gazzardi began covering the political aspirations of a young teacher named Jeremy Carpin. Carpin, like Gazzardi, was young and, like Gazzardi, not born in Chicago. He was a member of the Green Party, believed in lower taxes for the middle class and better schools for low-income students, and in November of 2010, would run for state rep in the 39th district. Enter the competition. Incumbent state rep Maria Tony Berrios. Since 2002, she has been re-elected to her position five times. A variety of factors have made it easier for her to retain this seat, when in 2010, Carpin challenged the idea that she, quote, de facto represents the people of the community somehow better because she is Puerto Rican, for example. Berrios countered with the argument that the 39th district was intentionally drawn with a majority Latino constituency. The reason for that, Berrios told Gazzardi and the Huffington Post, is so that we can have more Latino representation downstate. 
Tony Berrios' dad is Joe Berrios. He was born to Puerto Rican parents in Cabrini Green. According to his personal website, he got his first job washing dishes at age 13, but it was around the same time that his real career began. Starting as a teenager, Berrios worked for the Alderman Thomas Keene's political organization, learning along the way what it meant to be a Democrat in Cook County. By 1974, Keene was in a federal prison in Kentucky on charges of insider trading, and Joe Berrios was a precinct captain. In 1982, Berrios landed his first job as an elected official. Today, he is the Cook County Assessor, a committeeman for the 31st Ward, a commissioner on the Illinois Board of Review, and the chairman of the Cook County Democratic Party. So it's not just Tony Berrios, 34-year-old Liquor Control Commission employee that Jeremy Carpin was up against in the general election 2010. It was the tax attorneys who want breaks from the Cook County Assessor. It was the career politicians who might need votes from the chair of the Cook County Democratic Party. It was anyone who needed a favor in Cook County. Jeremy Carpin lost the race for state representative, coming in with about 35% of the vote. Gazzardi, who had written every headline from the greening of Logan Square to green against the machine in hopes of making a dent, watched as the Democratic machine wore Carpin down. In a 2010 interview with Carpin, Gazzardi asked him about the obvious racial issue, how he felt representing the flow of new money and youth into the neighborhood. There is an unpleasant discord when the young idealist is forced to admit that he's riding the wave of gentrification to power. Carpin responded, it sucks. The feeling sucks. Gazzardi announced his candidacy for state representative in the summer of 2011. The 39th District of Illinois is comprised of Belmont Cragen, Avondale, Hermosa, and Logan Square. In Logan Square, where Gazzardi's headquarters are located, people between the ages of 25 and 34 make up almost a third of the population, which explains the pro proliferation of new bars and restaurants, one of which seems to spring up every three months. The Berrios campaign is, somewhat unsurprisingly, located in Belmont Cragen, where the population is 78.8% Hispanic as compared to Logan Square's 51.7%. Belmont Cragen, where half of the inhabitants are under 17 or over 50, is where Tony Berrios' family lives. Will Gazzardi was born in New York City. His father is a publisher, his mom a social worker. He attended high school in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and was ultimately accepted to Brown University. There, he developed interest in jazz, comedy, and writing. He is an excellent pianist. At Brown, Gazzardi also co-founded an online literary magazine called Wags Review that has featured the musings of cultural figures from Stephen Colbert to Alison Bechtel. We usually say he moved here after college, says campaign manager Rebecca Reynolds, driving Gazzardi back to headquarters in Logan Square. But if they push it, Gazzardi's lived here for two years. Long before he had ordered campaign stickers or booked the kickoff party, Gazzardi hired Rebecca Reynolds, whose previous work experience included working for Jeremy Carpin. Reynolds is a loud talking, volunteer herding idealist, but a hard nosed one. She learned everything she needs to know about campaigns from reading, networking, attending conferences, and learning on the job. She knows the best time of day to send out emails, just after lunch or before people leave work, the correct number of times to confirm a voter support, twice, and how much you can expect to get from a major donor on the second donation, about three quarters of the original amount. The sole remnants of the Buzz Stop Barbershop's former occupants are some tissue for collar lining and a bit of window paint on the front door reading, Walk-ins Welcome. When the campaign moved into the space, they washed away the rest of the paint, but Gazzardi spared that message, finding it particularly apt. Lists of voter addresses and postcards with Gazzardi's face on them cover tables and volunteer sign-up charts drawn on whiteboards cover the walls. The back office has a separate bathroom whose sink is crowded with razor blades, shaving cream, toothpaste, and deodorant. Extra large dress shirts on hangers are strung up along the windows. On the coffee table, near where Rebecca stages nerve-wracking training sessions, there's a printout of a New Yorker story called How Underdogs Can Win. I'm supporting Will Gazzardi because I believe we need independent leaders who will be accountable only to us and not to big money and special interests, Rebecca says slowly and clearly. Now you say it. Even in the face of grouchy constituents with their hair in rollers and kids screaming in the kitchen, Reynolds says every word slowly and with a smile. She wrote the rap sheets and she also tested them. A few months in, regular voters noticed a change in the script. Reynolds, who noticed that not all constituents knew who the incumbent Tony Berrios was, so she added another clause. She's the daughter of Joe Berrios. Reynolds' mantra is that if only 9,000 people are going to vote, then you only have to shake 4,501 hands to win. When talking to a voter, volunteers have to score their responses, with a one being a yes, a two being a probable yes, a three a maybe, fours and fives don't count. After a month of keeping such tallies, though, Gazzardi came up with a new response code, ABB, or anybody but Berrios. 
One of those was Tony, a middle-aged press machinist for the Chicago Tribune with nine grandkids. If property taxes keep rising, Tony told Gazzardi, his wife and him would be forced to move to Indiana. Tony asked Gazzardi how old he was, and I expected him to laugh when Gazzardi said 24. Instead, he said, you wouldn't know it with all that gray hair. That's good, though. Get some young faces in there. When Gazzardi asked if he could count on Tony's vote in the primary in March, Tony said yes, for him and his wife. In February of 2004, Joe Berrios openly admitted to pushing Pedro de Jesus out of the race against his daughter. When asked in the same year why he had stopped supporting the opponent of a donor to his daughter's campaign, Berrios told the Chicago Reader, Everybody's been trying to get everybody together in the neighborhood. So when Alvarez came for me to help, I said, not this time. In the last election, I believe I gave him $70,000. So you can understand why he changed his mind about running. In May of 2011, the Sun-Times reported that Joe Barrios had given one of his children a $10,000 annual raise, even as other employees were dealt a mandatory 12-day furlough. He was simultaneously accused of lobbying in Springfield for legislation sponsored by his daughter. Said Tony Barrios in 2004 of her father's protectiveness, He's my father. He's there to help his daughter. When you've got a million dollars in campaign funds, watch $100,000 between family. In February of this year, someone bought an ad from the Chicago Sun-Times that read, Happy V-Day, Uncle Joe. Thank you for the jobs and promotions. We could not have gotten them without you. With love, the Barrios family. Alonzo Zaragoza, who was running against Joe Barrios for Democratic committeeman in the 31st Ward, took the credit for the ad, and political junkies from Lake Michigan to Cicero had a laugh. It probably won't prevent Zaragoza from getting crushed in the election, though, just as full knowledge of the misdeeds of establishment candidates hasn't prevented anyone from winning an election in Chicago from the city's inception. This is what Chicagoans proudly but quietly refer to as the Chicago machine. It's a label that's used almost recklessly. A thing of lore it may be, but glamorous it's not. Being a machine politician involves a lot of standing in line and waiting your turn. Last fall, appellate justice Rudy Garcia accused Barrios of yanking his Democratic Party endorsement because seven years ago, Garcia refused to throw a case for him, despite the fact that word came down Barrios wanted to see it go a certain way. Barrios says Garcia lost the name nomination because Rudy didn't work. He called one committeeman. If he'd gotten off his fat ass, he could have gotten it. He's a funny man, but Joe Barrio seems genuinely unaware that handshaking, phone calling, and ass kissing are not actually the work of an appellate court justice. In Barrios' mind, that's the most important work a politician does. It took him over 40 years to be able to masterfully manipulate the insidious network of favors that permeates Chicago's daily grind. He began as a precinct captain, much like a drug lord begins as a lookout. For the Barrios family, it's just another iteration of the American dream in which hard work is compensated by wealth and security. Chicago ain't ready for reform. Don't make no waves, don't back no losers. Ubi es mea. Where's mine? Urban historians are quick to point out that Chicago didn't invent the political machine. New York had the first, and Philadelphia even had a machine run by Republicans. All it takes is an economically depressed, heavily immigrant underclass and an opportunistic, resource-rich political class. Early in the invention of social science, scholars pointed the, to, to the machine's connotations of bribery, intimidation, and fraud, not to mention extortion, murder, and Al Capone. While other cities gradually learned to want more out of their government, however, Chicagoans have retained much lower expectations. As Michael Hinkydink Kenna, one-time boss of the First Ward, once put it, Chicagoans never go for the big stuff. Former Illinois Governor Daniel Walker began his political career walking the precincts of Chicago. He ended it in prison, of course, though shockingly not on charges of corruption, but for insider trading. In his autobiography, Walker writes of his introduction to the political machine, how at first trading baskets of vegetables for votes and giving homeless people false voter registration cards in exchange for bottles of liquor felt wrong. Even as he worried about the ethical aspect of the system, though, Walker appreciated that there was an immediacy, a directness, a simple justice to it, a favor for a vote. It was what it was, and it didn't pretend to be anything more. Dan Walker became part of that system as an adult. Tony Berrios was born into it. Tony's not evil, said Gazzardi at a recent policy event. She's just not accountable to voters. She's never had to operate in a system where there was an incentive to act in accordance with a moral standard. On election day, the machine, creaking and groaning in its hundred and some years of use, will lurch once more into action, spurring retirees from their couches, palm cards in hand. Over 50 years ago, on the opposite side of the city, another young reformer, Alderman Leon Desprez, was fighting a similar battle against the machine. Like, like Gazzardi, Desprez rode his bike to and from the office, prompting Mike Royko to question if Desprez was really an alderman after all, seeing as he didn't own a Cadillac. 
A reformer, Des Press spoke out against segregation when even African-American aldermen were rubber stamping Mayor Daley's racist housing legislation and ferried Chicago through the Shackman decrees, ending party control of city jobs. Keenan Hives, who spent 30 years at the Chicago Tribune during the first Daley administration, said of Disprez, in a city government run on clout and patronage, he had neither. Gazzardi, too, has neither clout nor patronage, but the dream, as hard as it is to imagine, is a city that requires neither. It's hard to imagine because the machine is ingrained in the city's identity, passed down from generation to generation, from daily to daily, from do father to daughter. The voters who perpetuate it, the journalists who write about it, and the party liners who depend on it have lived in the Chicago so long they can't imagine that there is another way. Alderman Desprez, though, saw another way. I fell in love with the city the way some do a sport or the theater or even a writer, he wrote in his autobiography. Politics in Chicago may breed cynics, but it's the lovers, especially the blind ones, that will change it. Thank you and congratulations, Caroline. Uh, and congratulations and thanks to Michael and Nassim for sharing their work as well. Um, I want to close the formal pro program for the evening, uh, after which I'll invite you to s stick around as well as enjoy um, additional food for the reception. There may be a few cupcakes left, I'm not sure. Uh, but I'll close the, the formal program with a quotation from a former Chicago resident, uh, a native of Saturn, uh, Sun Ra, a jazz great. And then when I went to Chicago, that's when I had these outer space experiences and went to the other planets. I hope our authors tonight have both kept you grounded in the fantastic complexities of the city and inspired you to explore a few other neighborhoods or perhaps planets you might not have otherwise. Thank you and good night. <laughs>